Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about publication ethics. Uh, people have talked to you about other ethics before. So uh, when I do this face to face, I put the slide up and ask you if there is a problem. I'll still pose this question to you. So a senior clinician requests uh, is requested to write a chapter for a new book. He's written an original article on the subject recently. Since the book and the article are totally different formats for different audiences, he reproduces the text tables and diagrams from his published paper in his chapter. Now for a lot of us, this may be considered to be perfectly fine. Uh, however, there is a problem. There is a problem if I don't tell people that this is what I've done. If I tell people this is what I've done, then it's fine. But what I need to do is to tell people that I've done this. Uh, of course, once you tell people that you've done this, there could be people who would say, what kind of a fellow is he? Why can't he give us something original? Why is he writing the same thing all over again? So uh, that could be a reaction at the most that could come up, but nobody could accuse the person of uh, being unethical or not doing what is supposed to be done. So behavior or actions which do not conform to existing ethical standards in conducting research or publishing research, both are considered as scientific misconduct. What I'm going to talk about today is issues related to publishing research, not conducting research. Uh, that I believe would have been covered already. So those would be issued of issues of informed consent, of trial registration, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, publishing research. And as you have a talk on plagiarism immediately after my uh, session, I am not going to spend too much time on plagiarism except to just touch upon it and uh, uh, say a few words about it. So does misconduct or unethical practices, do they, do they happen? Do they occur? Yes, they do. Uh, amongst the first few instances when people thought that there was something which a person did very deliberately or very, uh, or one of the well-known episodes is those uh, that of Summerlin, who in 1974, going to get an extension of his grant, uh, hadn't succeeded in doing the previous experiments the way he wanted them to. Uh, while sitting in his car on the way to the funding body, uh, decided to paint a black patch on the picture of a white mouse, suggesting that he could transplant skin of black mice onto white mice. Uh, he got caught out and uh, obviously uh, had to face the consequences. In 1994, the US Congress, the equivalent of the Indian Parliament, uh, was intrigued by the number of what they thought was research misconduct instances and they had an investigation put up and they could document 57 instances of documented scientific misconduct. Other than that, there could be uh, obviously issues which uh, may not necessarily be considered as serious misconduct. So I don't know how many of you are aware, but uh, the discovery of streptomycin had some controversy to it. Uh, in 1952, Selman Waxman received the Nobel Prize for discovering streptomycin. But a few years later, one of his, uh, one of his uh, students uh, was considered a co-discoverer of streptomycin. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a Nobel Prize winner, but he was considered a co-discoverer of, of the uh, drug and in fact received royalties from the drug as well. Uh, I, I hope most of you have heard of Eugene Ronwald, uh, one of the editors in chief for many editions of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. And he had a student or a, uh, or a investigator working with him called John Darcy, who falsified uh, uh, abstracts, papers, left, right, and center, and ultimately had uh, over a hundred retractions uh, that happened. On most of these retractions, Eugene Braunwald was a co-author. The story behind it is interesting, but I won't spend time over it, maybe another day. Uh, David Baltimore, a Nobel laureate, had some issues to face because an investigator 
working in his lab, uh, accused another lab, which was also under him, of scientific misconduct. Uh, he was at that time president of the Rockefeller Foundation and because of this controversy had to step down from that position. There was once a paper published uh, on, on uh, uh, not a paper actually, an abstract presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, suggesting that women with breast cancer who had uh, bone uh, metastases could benefit from improved survival by doing bone marrow transplants in these patients. It was an investigation which uh, was carried out by uh, the local hospital plus uh, the journal Lancet, which ultimately led to the discovery that all this was uh, actually fraudulent work. The work had never been done. The 50, 60 or 70 odd patients who were supposedly had received bone marrow transplant uh, uh, did not exist was actually only five or six patients, and none of them uh, had the kind of outcome that was described in that particular abstract. More recently, uh, some of you may have, may have uh, noticed uh, a few years ago, prior to COVID, um, a Korean scientist was accused of ethical issues of plagiarizing or, or falsifying data related to uh, stem cell research. And because of this accusation, in fact, this Korean researcher committed suicide because of uh, the, the bad publicity that he uh, received. Uh, so if there are anesthetists in the audience, my apologies. Uh, I have an anesthetist at home as well, my wife. So apologies to her as well. But uh, these were famous instances uh, of one of the editors of a prestigious anesthesia journal going after uh, people who published in that journal multiple papers which were actually fraudulent. So uh, Scott Rubin uh, did work on pain medication and it was found he never did the studies but went ahead and published this work. Joachim Bolt did research on colloid and uh, 89 of his 102 studies were considered definitely fraudulent. Uh, what about the others? They, they couldn't establish definitely that uh, the data didn't exist at all. There was some data available, but uh, a lot of the data was not. Available. Yoshitaka Fuji, an aesthetist uh, who did a lot of work on post-operative nausea and vomiting. He had uh, 212 of his 249 papers investigated. And of these 212, over 150 papers had fabricated data. Now, a lot of us have heard of the phrase publish or perish, but this, is, this kind of behavior obviously is not an attempt at publish or perish. Uh, this is something that is far beyond that. To, to my mind, this is uh, you know, a person whose behavior is abnormal. Uh, if a person is going on fabricating data and falsifying data, paper after paper after paper. So uh, plagiarism is another big issue. And because you have a talk uh, immediately after this, uh, I will not spend too much time on this. But if a paper is plagiarized, then more often than not, it leads to retraction. And you would see a, a notice such as this one uh, appear in the journal in which the article was published. Uh, this is many years ago, in fact, in 1992, that the BMJ and the Lancet both, one after the other, carried uh, what they called expressions of concern. And the reason they called these expression of concern rather than retract these papers was that their investigation could not establish beyond doubt that there was, uh, there was fraud. Uh, however, uh, this beyond doubt was. Uh, to the extent that a court of law would have considered uh, would have considered this as uh, as something that was unacceptable and the legal departments of these journals uh, advise the editors not to uh, retract the papers but to publish expressions of concern this is the expression of concern related to uh, the same papers that were published or a series of related papers that was published in, in the Lancet. 
the study came out of of India, and uh, therefore uh, the reason to highlight this just to tell you that this is not all these things don't happen elsewhere; they happen in India as well. So it's not just publish or perish. Yes, to some extent, and maybe publish or perish. I I need two papers. So Summerlin was maybe publish or perish. But Scott Rubin, Joachim Bolt, and uh, Fuji were certainly not publish or perish. They were far beyond greed. They were not just greed. They were far beyond greed, to my mind. So these are serious issues. So serious misconduct uh, in science occurs when there's fabrication and falsification of data. Uh, and this is this could happen at various points in time. This could happen while you were doing the research that you uh, you know fudge data. Uh, or you can just sit down at a, at a desk, which is what some people did, uh, and go ahead and produce something that uh, didn't sort of exist. And finally, of course, uh, the serious scientific misconduct also includes plagiarism. Uh, then we've got issues which are still misconduct. There are unethical issues, but uh, may not be viewed as seriously. Redundant publications, which includes duplicate publications, and we'll talk a little bit about these as we go along, or salami publications. And salami is obviously slicing things into smaller pieces, and therefore you have a large piece of research and you slice it. Conflicts of interest, and this is something that uh, needs to be understood well, because uh, we could very easily not understand the term, uh, the phrase, and, and do something which could actually be in violation of ethical principles. Yeah. Authorship is a major issue. It's a major issue for, for, uh, for uh, students and mentors because students often feel that they've done the work and they should get all the credit, while mentors feel that they, have, they are the people who are the force behind the work. They are the, the thinkers behind the work and they should get all the credit and the student is only a cog in the wheel. So uh, this is a major issue and we'll spend some time discussing authorship as well. Finally, uh, I'll just mention a little bit about pseudo journals and journals that if we publish in could, could lead to ethical issues and therefore we should try and avoid publishing in these, uh, in these journals. So these are the fabrication, falsification, plagiarism are serious scientific misconducts. Now, what is fabrication? It is making up data or results and recording or reporting them. Now you could do this while conducting research when it would be uh, a violation of research ethics. And you could do this while writing up research, which would then be violation of publication ethics. And while writing up research, you could introduce non-existent data or information. Things that you haven't done, you could say, I've done these just to strengthen the study that you have conducted. Or uh, you could add data and numbers. So you did 50 patients, but you thought 100 looked better, and therefore you did to multiply everything by two to get a, a round figure of 100. Or you could do only five or seven or 10 patients and you portrayed these as a thousand patients or 500 patients and say, okay, these are the results. The results of five patients become the results of 500 or a thousand patients. And it's not that it's not done. It's, it's, it's done uh, frequently enough for people to be bothered about it. Uh, one of the reasons people are more worried today about ethical issues in publishing, especially fabrication and falsification, is because you often do systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We are combining data from multiple studies to get more strong results or information, more reliable information. And if you were to rely on one or two papers which had false data in them or fabricated data in them, you could definitely change the outcome of your systematic review or meta-analysis. And this could then impact the outcome of patients who would receive those treatment modalities which may not actually have uh, the strength that they're supposed to have. Now, falsification is when you manipulate research materials, equipment, or processes, or change or omit data or results 
in a manner that your research is not accurately represented in the research record. And the research record finally is your scientific paper that gets published. So you could alter data, you could conceal data, you could withhold data. I have data, but I don't want to give this data out because if I give this data out, then my conclusions that I'm drawing are no longer valid. I could do this partly or I could do this completely. I could do it with data and I could do it with images as well. And image manipulation has been uh, something else that has been of concern over the past decade or so. Now, what is, is plagiarism? There are multiple definitions of it, but to understand it easily is appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. The American Association of University Professors uh, defines this as, and I quote, taking over the ideas, methods, or written words of another without acknowledgement and with the intention that they be taken as the work of the deceiver. Quote closed. Now, what is important is the last few words here. Intention to, that they be taken as the work of the deceiver. Now, it's very difficult to, to, to establish intent. And therefore, a number of times, uh, work that has actually been plagiarized doesn't get labeled as plagiarized work or doesn't get retracted because this bit of the intention cannot be documented or cannot be proven. But otherwise, the intention needs to be there. If I do it uh, by mistake, it could, you know, I could get away with it. But if I do it deliberately, and when I copy paragraphs after paragraphs from somewhere else, then obviously it's done deliberately. There's a Singapore statement on research integrity. If I remember correctly, this was in 2005 or 2006 that people got together and, and talked about this. So they said honesty in all aspects of research, accountability in the conduct of research, professional courtesy and fairness in working with others, and good stewardship of research on behalf of others. And there's a whole lot of information here, which uh, uh, they, if, you, if you are interested, you can go and read up. Uh, but essentially, if you present the results clearly, honestly, and without fabrication, falsification, or inappropriate data manipulation, that's good international standards for authors. You adhere to publications requirement that submitted work is original and is not plagiarized and has not been published elsewhere, and that's duplicate or redundant publication. Take collective responsibility for what you submit and publish. Uh, so if there are 12 authors on a paper, all 12 are equally responsible. I can't say I just looked at the statistics part and somebody else can't say I looked at just doing the lab investigations. And somebody else says I looked at only the clinical information and getting it all together was somebody else's job and that person cooked up things. So there is collective responsibility and the authorship should accurately reflect an individual's contribution to the work and its reporting. And this is from that statement, uh, the Singapore Statement on Research Integrity. So plagiarism is copying somebody's words, ideas and work. It's not uncommon, it's serious. And in India, it's becoming an issue. People have started to lose jobs or not be selected for a job because uh, they were accused of and uh, proven to have plagiarized work. Now, there are different extents of plagiarism, and I'm not going to uh, go into this in, in detail, except to say that the least severe type, the, there is probably no intention to deceive, while in the most severe type, there is an intention to deceive. And the, the in-between is a gray area between the attempt to deceive and not no attempt to deceive. And uh, Stephen Schaefer, who's, uh, who was the editor of a journal called Anesthesia Analgesia, he tried to define this as intellectual theft, categorize this as intellectual theft, intellectual sloth, plagiarism for scientific English and technical plagiarism. The end result you would see at the end of the column was retraction of the paper in all instances. And of course, in the most ser serious one, uh, the author's institution would be informed and there could be sanctions that would be imposed on the authors, sometimes the department and sometimes the institution as well. Now, 
is there something which is can be called fair use can i use something uh, which has been published by somebody else for say for example to teach yes i can as long as i'm transparent and tell people that this information comes from so and so's paper and i'm using this information so once i i am transparent i tell people this is not my work the intention to deceive aspect goes away completely so what about copyright laws so copyright laws allow fair use uh, but the limit there's a limit on the number of words and that's 120 words but plagiarism you could plagiarize just 20 words and you could be accused and proven to have plagiarized those 20 words because those 20 words could be an idea which you was not your original idea was somebody else's original idea so while copyright laws allow you to use uh, information fairly and 120 words is the limit you could be accused of plagiarism by copying just 5 10 15 2 words can you recycle text i've written something before i need to rewrite the same thing all over again for somebody else in a different format can i use my own words well text recycling in the sense that i am using my own words or also called self plagiarism can be done but there's a limit to it but much more important is the declaration the instance of or, or the 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 transparency so that there's no intention to deceive so how do you prevent plagiarism you know when you plan your paper take notes while reading other people's papers rather than having photocopies in front of you when you start typing out information when you start typing out those sentences you will have a writer's block and the attempt would be or the 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 temptation would be to look at what somebody else has published before use a sentence from there but if you've taken your own notes and you refer to your notes then it's unlikely that you would copy something verbatim from something that's already been written out always cite appropriately and citing appropriately would tell you will tell another person that that uh, this information comes from somebody else and if you learn to paraphrase appropriately then again you would not be accused of plagiarism now you can detect plagiarism easily there's software available which is free as well as commercial and listed out some of these uh, some of these are free and others are, are commercial softwares which you would need to buy uh, my institution subscribes to authenticate and uh, allows access to all the faculty to use authenticate to look for plagiarism in published work i'm sure your own institution would do something similar or you could then use if you if you had a doubt that somebody is given you a first draft and you're not sure whether it's plagiarized or not you could go and use something like google for example uh wiper crosscheck and there are a number of other uh, free softwares and uh, try and see whether the the information that has been given to you is plagiarized or not then move on to redundant publications these are two kinds duplicate publication and salami publication so what is duplicate publication if i publish something and then publish something else again a few months a few years later a few weeks later in the same journal in a different journal with the same authors different set of authors <coughs> doesn't matter if there is substantial overlap then that's considered duplicate publication so i could publish in a print journal and then go and publish in an online only or an electronic only journal even then that's considered duplicate publication why are we as editors bothered we as researchers would be very happy to do this because it would bolster our cvs but why are we as editors bothered we are bothered because it's a waste of resources because we need to send out these papers for peer review and peer reviewers good peer reviewers are very scarce commodity in today's scientific community you could miss some present information so you've actually done 14 patients but you've written them up twice and that becomes 28 patients so in a systematic review or meta analysis your 14 patients are considered as actually 28 so in in some form you fabricated or falsified your data 
You could also misrepresent this information by providing results which may not be valid. And the counting problems would obviously become an issue in these kind of settings. What is permitted? Can I not ever publish something or present something somewhere and then present it in another form? So a preliminary report is acceptable. I could publish an abstract. So an abstract published in a journal, if I go and present at a conference, my presentation would have been selected based on an abstract that I submitted. And that abstract could get published in a peer-reviewed journal. It could probably get published as in a supplement issue or it could be published in a regular issue. And this could get cited somewhere. And then a pay, full paper that gets written up could get cited and somebody could pick up duplication here. But that's acceptable as long as I, when I write the full paper, say clearly that this has been presented and published, presented at such and such conference and published as an abstract in such and such journal and provide the complete citation. I could also present a poster. So an oral presentation is fine. I could even present a poster and I could do this at a conference or I could do it at a small meeting or I could do it to a group of colleagues and that would all be acceptable. My information that I have, I'm presenting as a full paper, a small bit of that information could be given out as a flyer to people uh, who were covering uh, the media people, the press people um, who were covering a conference or a meeting. So this information could be given out to them as, uh, as a handout and that's acceptable. But there should be no data that's given out. There should be generalities that are presented and not actual information, uh, uh, you know, percentages and numbers of how many patients and so on and so forth don't need to be given out. Now, does duplicate publication occur? Yes, it does. So I haven't looked at, uh, uh, at, at studies after 2010, but in 2010, I'd found this study which looked at uh, duplicate publications and then they, they looked at four orthopedic journals and found a 3% duplicate publication. Two plastic surgery journals, less than 1%. Ophthalmology publications, about 1%. And in three surgical journals, about 14% duplicate publication. Now look, these are just three journals, four journals in a speciality. Now, if you take all the journals in a speciality, this, these numbers could easily go up. Or these proportions, these percentages could easily go up. So it does happen. This, this one uh, was, uh, this particular data came from Ian Chalmers and his group and was published in the British Medical Journal. Does this happen in India? Yes, it happens in India. There's enough information that this does happen. Uh, there have been enough instances of duplicate publication. Uh, there may not be a formal study, but there, there have been enough inst instances of duplicate publication that have been recognized. So what about duplicate submission? I've written up a paper. I know a journal can take a long time to peer review a paper. So maybe I'll send this off to five journals and one of them will accept it quickly. And the one which accepts it quickly, I'll go ahead and publish in that and withdraw my paper from the other four journals. So if you haven't had got this idea before, and if I've given you this idea, please for heaven's sake, don't try it out. What could happen? This is not permitted number one, of course, but what could happen? This could lead to duplicate publish. Two journals could go ahead and accept the paper and one of them could go online immediately without referring back to you. And if they do that, they just inform you that they've accepted the paper. And the second journal could go ahead and actually do a formal uh, publishing of the paper and you get two papers, the, exactly the same material, and then you get accused of duplicate publication. Uh, the issue of peer review being wasted or peer reviewers time being wasted does appear in duplicate submissions. So simultaneous publication could happen uh, and is permitted if again you're transparent. So what I could do was that I could write up something along with 50 other people. I don't know how many of you are aware, but this happens quite frequently. But recently, uh, last year, and it's going to happen again this year, 
just before the COP, the climate change meeting that happens. Uh, so last year, I think it was in Glasgow, Scotland. And just before that meeting, about 200 odd journals wrote up an editorial, uh, well, published an editorial. I won't say all the journals contributed to writing up the editorial. Uh, but I think about 18 or 20 editors who jointly wrote up the editorial. Uh, but over 200 journals simultaneously published that to make an impact on people who were discussing climate change and uh, highlight to them the issues related to the impact of, of climate change on healthcare. So uh, simultaneous publication, again, with disclosure is permitted, but uh, not duplicate submission. So what are salami science or what is salami publication? When you, from a single data set, create multiple publications, and you tend to do this when you do a retrospective study, you collect data, and then they split the paper up to say the information related to the radiology, the information related to the pathology, the information related to the medical treatment, the information related to surgical treatment. And out of a single data set of say 200 patients, you now get four papers. Now this is not acceptable. This is considered salami publication. An attempt to bolster your CV, increase the numbers in your CV by doing multiple publications from a single data set. However, there could be instances where some patients may overlap when you do incremental follow-up studies, but when is a follow-up study incremental and acceptable and when is not acceptable can be very controversial. So if you were to publish something very soon after what you published before, you must inform the editors. And in preventing the accusation of an unethical behavior related to publication, the key weapon that you have is to be transparent. So when you do a local publication versus an international publication, is that acceptable? Yes, it is, though it is duplicate. So I could publish in say a Hindi language. We don't have an Hindi language journal to the best of my knowledge, but I can publish a, 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 a paper in a Hindi language journal and then go and publish it in an English language journal. And this could be duplicate publication, but acceptable uh, as long as I'm transparent and inform both editors, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I could, from a large data study, using the same data set, draw two conclusions or three conclusions. Each of these conclusions may be, may be important for a different audience. So say I was studying patients with uh, diabetes and we all know diabetes has manifestations related to a number of organs. I could have something from this large data set which could be relevant to cardiologists, relevant to neurologists and relevant to endocrinologists. And I could then have a very valid reason to create three different papers. But if I create three different papers with multidisciplinary conclusions. Again, the key thing to do is trans be transparent. Inform the editors of the journals to whom you're submitting these, that this is what you're doing and explain why you're doing this. There are examples of this. The BMJ and the NEJM published two papers from the same data set on glucose tolerance. And the American Journal of Cardiology and the NEJM published two papers from the same data set on conclusion that were multidisciplinary on a study on syncope. In both instances, the authors informed the editors. They gave reasons to justify this action of theirs. And this justification after the paper was accepted and published, this justification which the authors provided was also published in the journals. So how do you decide whether you should split up a paper in two or not? Ask yourself, is one paper more informative? If it is, then go ahead and keep it as a single paper. If you feel uh, no, splitting it makes the paper more clear, uh, more easily understandable, then go ahead and split. If you're not sure, then submit a single paper to the editors and inform them that this is what you felt like doing but didn't do. It quite 
uh, it's quite likely that if that is the scenario, if people are finding it difficult to read your paper and understand it, the editors may come back to you and say, remove data related to this uh, aspect of the paper and keep only the other aspect of the paper. Incremental follow-up, oncologists are very fond of doing this. So what is, what is useful incremental follow-up? So three months survival, four months survival, six months survival, uh, 48 patients, 56 patients, 102 patients, probably doesn't make many much sense. Three years follow-up, three and a half years follow-up, four years follow-up, doesn't make sense. Three years follow-up, 10 years follow-up, makes a lot of sense. 50 patients, 500 patients, makes a lot of sense. However, it's possible that 50 patients gave you one conclusion and 102 patients, you found something different. And if your conclusions were different, then certainly it makes sense to publish that information all over again. This should try and over, avoid overlap of any data, but in incremental follow-up studies, there would be some overlap of data. And then again, the key is to be transparent and say, six years ago, we published this information with this number of patients, provide a reference. And now with this incremental follow-up, we've got the same conclusions, but this information is now over a period of six years. Repetitive publication or duplicate publication could end up in retraction. This gentleman, if you look at the list of references here, first published this in Heart, then he published it in Circulation, and he finally published the same image in the New England Journal of Medicine, finally got caught and had to retract the paper. Uh, a word about uh, or a little bit discussion about conflict of interest. It exists when there's a divergence between an individual's private interests and his or her responsibilities to scientific publishing, such that a reasonable observer might wonder if the individual's judgment was motivated by those interests. This definition comes to us from the World Association of Medical Editors. There are a number of other definitions available, but I thought this was a comprehensive definition. Now, ties with activities that could inf inappropriately influence our judgment, doesn't matter whether it's actually influenced our judgment or not. As long as a reasonable observer would feel that this could influence the judgment. So for example, I have somebody who's, uh, whose paper, I am an editor of a journal and I'm sitting in judgment on uh, a relative's paper, that is definitely a conflict of interest because I might be inclined personally to favor that person. So uh, conflicts of interest could be financial, they could be personal, or they could be academic. Authors, reviewers, editors, all could have conflicts of interest. Now, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine pub gets published on Thursday evening. On Friday morning, depending upon whether the drug which has been reported on, the randomized control trial of the drug that has been reported upon, upon has a positive or a negative result, the stock exchange would see an upward, upward or downward movement of pharmaceutical, uh, of the pharmaceutical company's shares on the New York Stock Exchange. And this, if I am a shareholder and I am also the researcher, I would want to give a positive answer. And therefore that's a conflict of interest and I need to declare it upfront. I've given you an example of a personal bias. It could be an academic conflict of interest. I could be reviewing another person's paper and both of us could be competing for the, for the same job. And that's again a conflict of interest and I need to inform the editor that I have a conflict of interest. The decision to accept your peer review, uh, accept you as a peer reviewer or not lies with the editor, not with you. Your job is to be transparent and tell people that I have a conflict of interest. We now talk a little bit about authorship and what is authorship? It's public responsibility to defend a paper that you are publishing. And the defense is of the content, the data, as well as its interpretation. And the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors has four authorship criteria. Substantial contributions to conception and design or acquisition of data or analysis and interpretation of data. So these three are or, and drafting the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content, final approval of the version to, and final approval of the version to be published, 
and to take responsibility for errors and omissions too. An author must meet all these criteria before his or her name goes on to the authorship byline. Now, who are ghost authors? So we hear, you'll hear of ghost authors and gift authors. So uh, try and never be a ghost author and try and never be a gift author. So a ghost author is a person who writes the paper but is not listed as an author. Now, why should that happen? Why should I agree to my name not being listed as an author? Because I have a conflict of interest. So I could be working for a pharmaceutical company. I could be a medical writer for a pharmaceutical company. I could have background knowledge which was good enough to say uh, good things about a drug. I write up the paper, but if my name goes there on that paper, then it's very likely that people would look at my name, look at my affiliation, and take what I have, whatever I have said with a pinch of salt. On the other hand, I could go to a respected academic with this paper and say, if you think what I've written on this paper and you agree with this paper, would you like to have your name on this paper? And then I drop out of it and the respected academic's name goes on the paper who doesn't seem to have a conflict of interest. But I who've written the paper have a conflict of interest and therefore could have introduced pieces of information there which may be biased. This is common with industry sponsored papers. So there's incorrect content, incorrect credit and content attribution to a name. What about gift authors? Gift authors are authors who, uh, who do no work but get named as authors. So the most common group uh, who are listed here like this are, are uh, heads of departments or heads of units or mentors who haven't done anything who've never actually been mentors to us. Uh, sometimes you name them because you need to oblige them. Sometimes you name them because you feel, if I put down this person's name, the editor knows this person, the friend of this person, and therefore is more likely to accept the person, uh, the paper. So you hope to have your paper accepted. Again, if fraud is detected, you would say, I don't have anything to do with this. And the gifted authors would be the first one to, to sort of disown responsibility. So again, gift authors and ghost, ghost authors are not something that you want. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about is uh, related to publication ethics, because if you publish a paper in a pseudo journal or what have also been known as predatory journals, then if you go up to an interview and the interview panel understands these issues, looks through your CV, finds publications in a number of pseudo journals or predatory journals, they might A, question you, B, they might consider it inappropriate to select you for a job because of this particular reason. I've been on committees where, uh, selection committees where people have been very strong uh, about this and said, if we are going to select a person in the beginning of a career, who's done this, uh, who's done most of his or her publications in pseudo journals or predatory journals, what is this person going to teach to uh, the youngsters who come and train under this person? And therefore they would not want to select such a person. So what are pseudo journals? They published almost all submissions that go to them. They often charge you, charge you not very hefty amounts, not like PLOS where you would be charged $2,500 or $4,000, but they charge you 1,000 rupees or 2,500 rupees or 4,000 rupees. And if you ask them to give you a rebate, they'll very easily and very quickly give you a rebate. They often inform you about the payment or the charge after acceptance of the paper. Most of these journals would not do any form of peer review. Some of them would do some superficial kind of peer review. Unfortunately, there are journals which you take your money and not publish your paper. And this is now a tricky thing because your paper, your data is now theoretically published, but it's actually not published. Now you could say, okay, I'll take a chance and go and submit it elsewhere. But if you submit it elsewhere and this journal also goes ahead and publish, you could end up with a duplicate publication. You have no way of checking and cross-checking or ensuring that they don't publish because they just don't respond to you once they've got, you, got your money. 
So how do I check whether a journal is a true journal or a pseudo journal? So there's this website, www.thinkcheck-submit. Think, check, submit as a single word, .com, I think. Uh, I keep forgetting whether it's .com or .org. Uh, so if you go to this website, you will have a series of questions that are asked to you. And for each of those questions, if you end up saying yes, uh, then it's okay to go ahead with the journal. On the other hand, if you end up saying no, then you probably should stay away from this journal. This is not a 100% foolproof method. You could still end up with a journal, which is a pseudo journal. So I would suggest that you should discuss with your mentors as to whether or not you should publish in a journal which you've not heard of, which is not well known amongst your speciality, which you've never uh, presented a paper from in, in your journal clubs, which you've uh, not seen anybody else read a paper from. And those are the kind of journals that you would want to stay away from. So in summary, I've talked to you about plagiarism. I've talked to you about some of the types and prevention, but I've not gone into details. And I presume the next speaker is going to cover a lot of uh, what plagiarism is all about and how to prevent it. But I've just given you a flavor of plagiarism. I've talked to you about fabrication and falsification. I've talked to you about redundant publication, both duplicate and salami publications. I've given you a definition for conflict of interest, a simplistic way of understanding how conflicts of interest can be understood and the common types of conflicts of interest, uh, financial, personal, and academic. Talk to you a little bit about authorship. And finally, uh, just a word or two about pseudo journals. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.